conversation on inequality, moderated by Ramona Nadoff with Judith Butler and Angela Davis. It's my honor to present this panel. understand that uh, okay. there were people in wheelchairs who were turned away because of the capacity regulations for this hall and we want to violate those regulations. Yes, we're going yes, to violate those regulations. Yeah. So please open the door. Please open the door so the people outside can hand hear me. If there's anyone out there in a wheelchair and that would like to come in, please do so. Um, and also, if, um, if some people are standing and need to be sitting, um, would you uh, come forward and, and people who are actually sitting and don't need to sit, would you mind um, seating your place to them? And there's always a number three. Are there any certified uh, interpreters here that would like to help us out right now? Did someone say yes? Would sign language please? That's certified, thank you so much. Is there anyone else? Well, I'm sorry, but this is, gonna, this is the best we can do right now. Well, she's going to do the best she can right now. Please accept this as what we can do, and things will change in the future. We will discuss it. Thank you. I hear you. We're going to do the best we can. Is there anyone else that could help us with interpretation with sign language? We will discuss this. Please just wait, and it will be discussed. So, hi. I hate microphones, so excuse my lack of grace. I don't need to introduce Angela Davis or Judith Butler, but I'll just say I can't believe I'm standing next to these two activists, intellectuals, scholars, and public forces. And they've been an inspiration to me for more years than I'm going to tell you about. Um, so this is really going to be a conversation, but I just want to start it out um, with a few signifiers or chains of signifiers that I'm going to ask our panelists to talk about, putting them into relation with each other and talking about it not just on a local or national but also internationally. So I just want to lead with a few uh, issues that we might be able to approach the forces of inequality, equality, justice, and freedom through way of these. So the undocumented, Marine Le Pen, Black Lives Matter, prison reform, Palestine, proposition number eight, the anti Muslim ban. And I offer you to, to bring in any others that you would like, but I just wanted to lead with those that I think are rich with resonance and relations. So thank you again, and thank Timothy and Kira for organizing. Well, why don't we... Um, um Why don't we um, add disability to that list? We will. Um, and um, and let's, let's, let's start by, by actually talking about it as a matter of equality and inequality. Because um, um, when we talk about uh, 
spaces being accessible, uh, or when we talk about pavements being um, built in such a way that people in chairs have mobility, we're actually talking about rights of access, especially to public events, sometimes to public institutions, sometimes to modes of participation that are central to citizenship as we know it. And here I use citizenship to include those who got papers and those who don't. And, um, and, and we're also talking about rights of mobility, which are actually crucial for thinking about what democracy is, because if people cannot move, they cannot assemble, they cannot come together, they cannot deliberate, they cannot decide, they cannot reflect together, they are not part of the public world. So, um, so it goes to the heart of what we talk about when we talk about equality. Um, and it also uh, puts the body in the center of that uh, issue. Um, uh, equality is not just an abstract right that individuals have and bear and express in their own way. Um, equality is a question of um, equal treatment and equal opportunity, but also having lives that are regarded as um, as, as being equal in worth to all other lives um, and being able to exercise bodily freedoms. And that includes, I mean, for people who um, are in chairs or who have other kinds of um, disabilities, uh, uh, access and movement, but it also, let's think about it, there are a lot of people who can't move on the street. I mean, who has the freedom to move on the street? Who has the freedom to move in safety on the street? Um, without being shot, without being harassed, uh, uh, without finding an impediment um, with a curb stop, right? Um, these, these issues are linked. Um, and I just wanna underscore that the ability to move and to have the technology and the infrastructure that lets people move and, and assemble and participate and enter into spaces and, and, and traverse the public sphere is part of our freedom and it is also a place where we find radical inequality. Hi, Judith. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Judith likes to jump right in. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and I totally appreciate uh, the way in which you so eloquently um, um, allowed us to think about the degree to which issues of, of ability and disability are interwoven into all issues of inequality and injustice. Uh, let me say that um, um, there are some serious problems here. And I think it's always important when we come together as a community, how, however uh, brief that might be, to reflect on where we are and who we're sharing space with, who we should be sharing space with. Uh, and so first of all, I. Um, I think it's so important to recognize that we're on Olani, Ohlone land and mm -hmm. that uh, this is colonized land and, right. and that if we have a deep sense of the space, uh, we recognize the history of the space uh, and, and the fact that um, it, this is not accessible. Um, and, Yes, uh, there are many places, uh, many spaces that are inaccessible. But we should say that um, an event that, that um, is designed to celebrate um, intellectual community, uh, political community, mm -hmm. Uh, an event that is designed to allow us to engage in discussions about uh, racism, uh, misogyny, uh, globalization, uh, that that event should be accessible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's not. And I'm just going to reveal a little bit of the pre-event conversations we were um, ask uh, to cancel the event because it's not accessible and because we don't have uh, certified ASL interpreters. Uh, uh, and I can tell you that I'm sitting here very ambivalently now. Uh, uh, 
primarily because I think that these issues uh, should be discussed in a broad context and that all of you should be willing to take these issues to your community. I mean, we need, of course, a vast movement that is going to transform uh, this entire society with respect to uh, accessibility. Uh, uh, and this is just the beginning. So yeah, so I had to say that mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. I responded. Uh, mm -hmm to uh, the questions we've been asked to think about. Um, inequality, uh, on the one hand, it's, um, it can be very abstract. Uh, what do we mean by inequality? Uh, what, who sets the standards for equality? Uh, and I'm concerned about the fact that we often work with the assumption that that equality already exists, right? And that we have to be included, that, that, that some of us who have been left out of that space of equality have to be assimilated into equality. And, and I, you know, I don't think I have been uh, compelled to work with, uh, you know, historically, um, and I, you know, I know that democracy is a good thing or should be a good thing, or hope, hopefully one day will be a good thing. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I'm concerned about the fact that uh, the ways in which we tend to think about democracy are so totally racialized. Mm -hmm. uh, and we don't, and I always like to point out that we never talk about Haiti. We never talk about the Haitian Revolution mm -hmm. when it comes to uh, uh, the, the, the great advances that have been made with respect to uh, equ equality and, and, and justice and democracy. And if we did, we would have to talk about racism and we would have to talk about uh, misogyny. Great, welcome. Thank so, you. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Thank you. And I appreciate this entrance and this event. I want to let you know that we have deaf and disabled people of color outside who cannot come in. They don't have access to this event. We wanted to let you know that. They're being blocked from coming. I thought you, she was here to help us interpret. No, she's different. Okay. No, I thought you came and I understood. People do not have access to this event. So there are deaf people outside who have been barred from coming? I thought she was going to bring someone in. Is there anybody can ask if there's anyone out there that can yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, perhaps we should have a discussion about this and we should invite uh, uh, people I think who we need to invite people in, in. into the
of the organizers. Yes, but yes, Peter, but 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 yes, but people choose it and 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 shame on the city council. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But also we could be gathering in another space as well. Okay. So, Angela and Judith? I, I guess I would like to know whether, in fact, there are people out there who have not been able to gain access. And if that's, it, please go. And, and could you and please see if there's any uh, sign language the interpreters that could come in and help us? That I, I believe either certified or non-certified at this point. She just left. The, 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 so, the person who was assisting just walked out of the room. Hmm. Is everyone seated that needs to be seated? Right. Okay. All right. But then there's also the, the question of deaf people not being able to. There's also the question of the lack of an ASL, certified ASL interpreter, so that. Yeah, but let's not be defensive. Let's find yeah. a, an affirmative way forward. Right. Okay. So. Okay. That's true. <laughs> I, I think Kira tried to own it, and it, I think, as Angela said, we, we need to make this moment now something that will change. What we can do right now is limited, but I think we need to organize so it's different in the future and make this something about a potential change. And I, I really hope we can turn the conversation to reorienting our actions towards a different type of future as far as possible. Um, that's what we can do right now. And hopefully someone else will come in to help us uh, at least solve one problem. Well, we're all gathered here. And we're working under conditions that uh, are are certainly very difficult. But I think it's important to learn how to work through and with you know, all of the restraints. That to continue to have a discussion uh, should not mean that we're putting aside the issue of the inaccessibility of this space. Uh, and I think that um, um, you know, f feminism the kind of feminism that, uh, that I've learned from Judith Butler. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>
and the kind of feminism that one sees activists who are struggling against racism and, and challenging um, of the assaults on the undocumented, uh, the kind of feminism that they embrace is a, is a capacious feminism mm -hmm. that allows us to work at the heart of contradictions without necessarily being compelled to choose one side or the other. So I want to appeal to you to, to experience this sense of, of deep trouble uh, that, 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 that uh, is, is, is um, that has been brought about as a result of the problems of accessibility of this space and attempt at the same time to have a conversation that will hopefully move us forward. And I don't know what you all think about that. Uh, okay. And Judith, okay. what do you think? Um, <laughs> well, um, I jumped in quickly before, but let me say how honored I am to be here with Angela, uh, as we all are. And uh, Angela is someone from whom I have been learning now for a very long time. And um, she always shocks me into a new way of thought. It's, not, it's never an easy transition. Oh, I think I'll think about that. No, no. <laughs> it's like shock, shocks me into a new way of thought. And, um, and I think that, uh, you know, I was thinking about coming here um, I had kind of three thoughts. Uh, one was, um, as somebody who has worked in lesbian, gay, queer, and trans activism for many years, I, like many other people, had mixed feelings about the Equality Act and the equality movement within the lesbian and gay uh, community. And I'm going to call it lesbian and gay because I think that is exactly what that movement was. Um, that was pushing for that um, to, for marriage rights, and I was thinking what happened to the notion of equality when equality became identified with gay marriage rights, and um, and of course many of those people wanted to own property together or bequeath property or to become upstanding uh, middle class citizens of a certain kind and um, to have the same kind of recognition for their uh, relationships, their intimate, usually dyadic relationships um, uh, that, um, that straight people had. And, and I watched as kind of radical traditions of um, innovating and experimenting with for various forms of intimate um, alliances were backgrounded. I watched as property ownership became at the, the center of uh, the idea of freedom and equality, uh, I watched as well as state recognition became the object of desire. Um, and I thought, well, which state? And do we want that recognition? And what is the, what's the cost of recognition? Nobody was asking. Well, many people were asking, but it wasn't in the mainstream. But it was also, I think, a predominantly white movement as well. And uh, even though they were talking equality, as they talked, there was another tradition of the struggle for racial equality that struck me as, as effaced or as backgrounded as that became the new equality discourse. So when Angela says, what do we mean when we talk about equality, it seems to me we have to ask who's using it for what purpose and how does the use maybe mobilize a history or efface a history? What, what are the alliances that are made through one usage or another usage? And, um, and of course, I think if there's going to be marriage, anybody should be able to marry. I have no idea why you can only marry one other person, but okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm not like against it. And you know, if, if, you know, if there's going to be that right, then it should be extended to gay and lesbian people. There's no question about it. But the, the radical critique of marriage or even the, 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 the implication of marriage in property relations it's almost like we evacuate any analysis of political economy. We evacuate the analysis of the state, the state, and we also evacuate um, other traditions of the struggle for equality. Um, you know, what does it mean that Black Lives Matter is happening, or was, it still is happening to the side of an, of that equality uh, uh, issue? Like, are are they speaking to each other? I I think, in fact, not. I don't, I don't know if well, I want to go further with that, but yeah, and you know, I'm thinking that uh, there's 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 always been this push for assimilation, uh, 
uh, you know, why do we have to assume that existing modes, existing standards uh, are, are the ones to which we, 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 we have to assent? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. um, I mean, yeah, I very ambivalently supported uh, uh, the Marriage Equality Act and the, the same, but it seems as if, as you pointed out, there, 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 there ought to be a way to include a critique at the same time. And the problem is, the problem is not that uh, uh, people, oh, it's not loud enough? Okay. okay, well I can actually hold it like this if that's better. <laughs> And and so um, yeah, it's not it's 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 not the um, so much that uh, people um, assume that existing heteronormative uh, 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 standards of marriage are, were the only ones. It's the, it was the 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 reluctance to engage in a serious critique. You know, why, why is it not possible, say, to get married and at the same time recognize what a fuck, excuse me, I'm in the council right. table. You know, We're in council you know, what kind of an institution it is. You know, based, yes, based on, on, on property, based on property ownership, property inheritance, uh, I think property is the major problem here. Yeah. This is why it is not possible, I think, to engage in any serious conversation about inequality or equality without addressing capitalism. Yes. Without addressing capitalism. <laughs> and of course, there are those who want to address capitalism but who don't want to talk about racism, yeah. or who don't want to talk about misogyny, or who don't want to talk about homophobia, or any of the other issues. And unfortunately, um, you know, over the last period, both activists and scholars have learned that it is important, that it is possible, not only possible, but important to address these issues together. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the term that people use is intersectionality. I don't know whether that's the best uh, way to address it, uh, but uh, it's, it's not necessary to leave racism uh, in order to have a serious conversation about democracy. You know, one of the, 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 the problems now is uh, that Democrats, I think, uh, are, when I, when I say Democrats, I mean members of a certain political party, right, are assuming that the reason the election was lost had to do with what they call um, identity uh, politics. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That was know. definitely the reason. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And so now they're saying, let's forget about identity politics, which means let's forget about all of the issues that really matter when it comes to democracy, yeah. right? Yeah. And let's just, um, well, we need to talk about the working class more. And of course we need to talk about the working class. We've always needed to talk about the working mm -hmm. class. Mm -hmm. But the assumption is that the working class is white. And it's, th the assumption is still that the working class is male. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand how people walk around with these, these <laughs> They do, though. You know, I mean, I guess that's why ideology really is one's imagined relationship <laughs> to <Yeah>. reality. <laughs> yeah. Well, but let's take that seriously, because one of the things you're suggesting is that we don't yet know what equality might mean. Right? So you're asking us not to accept established ideas of equality. You're, not, you're asking us not to simply adapt or conform or to ask for assimilation to an existing framework of equality because equality has not yet been thought in the radical ways that it needs to be thought, which means we have to imagine it, which means we need, um, we need experimentations, as it were, of thought that allow us to think um, equality maybe for the first time or to think it anew. Um, 
And so often when we stay with existing frameworks, we find out that whole populations are left out or whole dimensions of, of human existence are left out. And um, I was thinking, for instance, um, that uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, which now is at risk, it's being criminalized in some places and it's at risk of being more massively criminalized depending on the momentum that some of these really pernicious uh, legal um, efforts are taking. Um, it was, I think, and is uh, still uh, adamantly asserting equality, but it's the, the equality of the value of life. And we might think in an abstract way, we know what that is. Oh yeah, all lives are equal, sure, all lives are equal, you know, that's in the Declaration, it's in the Constitution, yes, yes, yes. But this country no, has- No, say all men are all equal. All men, all men. I have to remind you that. Okay, all men. <laughs> but as we know that those forms of universalizing equality, saying all men, they always carry with them that, that grave exception, like gender, race, right? Um, uh, native peoples, um, uh, who's being effaced or whose effacement is being, is being further effaced through that assertion. And then the question is, but what would it mean for it to be, in fact, capacious, inclusive, uh, where, no, where nobody is sacrificed, right? Where, where no, when, when we talk about intersectionality, we are, I think we're trying to imagine a kind of analysis and a kind of movement that is all-inclusive in which nobody gets sacrificed. We don't sacrifice race for a political economy. We don't sacrifice sexuality for gender, right? We, we just don't do it. Um, but it. But it also means that the whole framework will have to be transformed. And I think the problem is, up until now, we assume that inclus inclusiveness uh, diversity, all of these, these watchwords uh, um, refer to an existing framework that right. continues to be the same. Yeah. And so what we want to do is, is make a racist society inclusive by including mm. Latinx people or black people, mm. but it's still a racist society. Yeah. Or make the misogynist society inclusive yeah by including, you know, yeah. so forth and so on. Yeah. So this is the dilemma that, um, that we confront uh, when we think about punishment. Mm. Uh, and this is why I think uh, uh, prison abolition is central, not only with respect to uh, the issue of reimagining a punishment system, but reimagining society. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so it's so interesting that if one looks at the, 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 the long history of the institution of the prison in uh, the U.S. and the world, the U.S., uh, which is really responsible for offering uh, imprisonment as punishment to the rest of the world, this uh, incidentally was a very important element of, uh, of the democracy uh, because in prison, prisons are... Uh, perhaps the quintessential democratic institution. Uh, oh. And we could talk about that if you <laughs> want. But, uh, uh, and, and, and so why is it that, that for, for centuries, decades and centuries, there have been these efforts to create a better prison? I mean, and it's been happening over and over and over again. And the better um, a punishment framework, the better uh, imprisonment techniques, uh, the better strategies have only led to um, more repressive, uh, uh, more um, racist, uh, you know, more uh, sort of uh, em all-embracing uh, carceral approaches. And we, we're, we're still there right now, even at this moment, when perhaps more than, than, than at any other time since perhaps uh, the, the beginning of the 70s with the Attica Rebellion, uh, uh, there is a consciousness of the need to do something about the fact that 25% uh, of the world's imprisoned population uh, resides in the U.S. and that one-third of all incarcerated women 
live in prisons in the United States of America. One third of all incarcerated women on the entire planet. But it seems that the mainstream question is still, well, okay, how can we make it better? Mm. You know, how can, we, okay, how can we release some, how can we move from mass incarceration to, uh, you know, I don't know what the, what the uh, opposite would be, selective incarceration? I don't know. <laughs> you know uh, but that has been the question. Mm -hmm. and, and abolition, urges us to think radically, to think outside of that framework, to think about something entirely different, mm -hmm. something entirely new. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, one part of your analysis that has been um, so important to many of us, Angela, is that uh, the prison system continues in some sense the legacy of slavery in this country when we consider the numbers of black and brown people who are incarcerated and that means deprived of their voting rights, deprived of the ability to function in public as citizens to, to participate in any way. So there's a, re it's almost as if um, uh, uh, the enfranchisement of the slaves um, is being reversed uh, through imprisonment, that pr imprisonment is the is the method through which voting rights are are um, uh, are destroyed for um, for 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 many many black and brown people, and I, I think we have to think about that that it is um, it is part of a systemic and institutional inequality. Um, I'm wondering if we could also relate that to your earlier remarks about keeping capitalism in mind. How do you? How do you put it together? Hmm. I know you do. <laughs> okay. okay, well, since you're inviting me. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, first of all, um, you know, capitalism, I, I, I like uh, you know, Cedric Robinson's notion of racial capitalism. Capitalism has always been racial capitalism. Uh, capitalism, um, would not be the uh, economic uh, um, institution, uh, global economic institution it is today, had it not been for slavery, uh, uh, had it not been for colonization. And, and somehow we think that, uh, that uh, these are separate issues, uh, but they are not. Uh, I, I, and I'm, I'm, I, I'm thinking, um, parenthetically about the difficulty that someone like uh, Bernie Sanders had incorporating an analysis of race into his uh, critique of capitalism. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's, it, that's exactly what, what we need, what we would have needed. Yeah. Uh, it would have worked much better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, I think uh, it was a, a secondary oppression once again, race is yeah, a secondary. Yeah, that you add it on, and you know, and I'm thinking about, um, I'm thinking about um, um, Elizabeth Spellman, who I read many years ago. We talked about the ampersand problem. You remember? You remember yes, I do. You know, of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> that you can't just add something on. You can't just add it and assume that the problem is solved. You can't just add, you know, black people. Uh, uh, into uh, the system and end up with people like uh, uh, Dick Parsons. Uh, I mean, he's not one of the wealthiest men in the world, but he was the CEO of what was it, Time Warner and AOL. And uh, you can't just assume that by adding the previously excluded into uh, the existing set of arrangements that there's gonna be any significant change. It continues the way it has always mm -hmm. uh, continued. Mm -hmm. And this is why I like uh, uh, the notion that, um, you know, diversity uh, means difference that really doesn't make a difference. Mm -hmm. You know, that mm -hmm. you can, that there can be difference, mm -hmm. but it na makes no, significant difference, and this is why we have to think about the extent to which slavery um, is very much present. Uh, we, this is still the afterlife of slave slavery. 
and many efforts to address the ways in which racism had become so central to the uh, social, political, economic structures and uh, the, the psyche, the collective psyche of the country, that has never been addressed. And therefore, we're still living that, that afterlife. And of course, the fact that uh, uh, there are, as Elizabeth Alexander pointed out, there are more black men in prison and under the control of the criminal justice system today in the 21st century than there were enslaved in 1850 uh, is one indication. Uh, um, but, um, but yeah, we're still living with slavery and it's not, it's not just the prison system, it's, 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 it's also capital punishment, uh, which would, capital punishment would not be a normal mode of punishment in the United States of America were it not uh, for slavery, were it not for the fact that this institution uh, survived through slavery at a time when um, even the, the, the men who were calling for democracy were saying that we need to abolish capital punishment. Benjamin Franklin and all those, those guys, those white guys back then. Uh, and we're st we still have it. And that is a sign that we have not effectively addressed the vestiges of slavery, and this is a problem not just for black people. Somehow, the assumption is that it's black and brown people, Asian people, native people who have to deal with racism. And I'm tired of that. Uh, you know, um, yeah, black lives matter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But the point, of course, is that if ever black lives were really to matter, that would mean that all lives matter. That's right. That would be that yeah. would be the We're indication. Not there yet. We're not there yet. That all lives matter. Yeah. It's a different yeah. approach to the universal. Yeah, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. But you know, I think that um, you know, when we when we see or witness uh, or experience in our personal lives, um, mainly black and brown people unarmed who are shot down, uh, uh, whether it's in Fruitvale or um, in Oakland or. Um, in North Carolina, um, or in Brooklyn, or, or, uh, or, or strangled, um, in a way we get the graphic, the, the graphic moment of that, that violence from slavery that has, has not vanished from the history of this country. Um, and of course, there, then the institutional means like death penalty and, and imprisonment, which continue that legacy in another way. Uh, and occasionally we get the very graphic um, uh, example of a black man being hunted down like a dog, right? I mean, really, uh, what, what is the difference between that and slavery or, or strangulation um, and slavery? So um, we do have that, but I wonder whether um, we could, as we think about the future and we, we, we take up your challenge to imagine um, equality in a new way uh, and to insist that it take a new form, one that's not been historically available to us, uh, what would it mean to, to think about um, a form of socialism that had anti-racism at its center, that didn't mm -hmm. sacrifice feminism, that was not transphobic, that was, that was taking into account the, 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 the deeply legitimate man demands of the disability mm -hmm. movement, where we actually had that kind of um, uh, uh, amazing collection of groups that understood each other and had a profound analysis of, of how capitalism works. Do you think you could show us the way, Angela? <laughs> but Judith, can I ask, don't you think sometimes with your work you do that with vulnerability she's and She's just precarity? joking. I know, she's joking you, but I know you're asking, but I'd like to ask you. Oh, about, yeah. About vulnerability and precarity as one of well, the main ways in which you are having us. Well, I guess what I'm, what I'm worried about is that a lot of my friends um, on the left who are still working in some older models of Marxism think we are dealing with wage laborers and their exploitation, and indeed we are. One reason we continue to need unions and have to 
really fight against the massive union busting, but a lot of people are no longer wage laborers. They work here and there. They have precarious work lives. They don't have, um, they don't have the possibility of being part of a union. They don't have those protections. They don't have property and they don't have health insurance. And that condition of precarity is, um, is extreme. So I think we have to um, listen carefully to those who are trying to explain to us these new versions of precarity. I mean, 12% um, of, the, of the world's population now lives in a global slum. I mean, what does that mean? And um, how many people uh, have any kind of job security anymore? It's become less and less the case. But do you think that unions can transform well, or that we can develop a new paradigm I, I think for, we need, I think for we, unions? I think we need to defend unions, and I think we need to work with unions. But I also believe that precarious work is a huge problem. And a lot of times, those people who are part-time, who are, who are only getting jobs seasonally, or they, they're not part of union structures because they're not there on a regular basis. But what if we think about um, very different union structures? Uh, um, that. I, I think this is the challenge, really. Uh, uh, you know, unions tend to think about wage labor, as you pointed out, in uh, these uh, you know very um, uh, rigid uh, traditional ways. Uh, but um, considering the fact that uh, with all of the changes that have happened as a result of globalization, that that women. Uh, who do manufacturing work, women who do um, care work, mm -hmm. uh, really constitute the new worker. And unions are not thinking about how to organize the unorganized. Yeah. Unions has always been, right? But why is it that unions are not thinking about organizing prisoners? There have been efforts in within the prison system in the U.S. for for decades to create unions in prisons, mm -hmm. so that workers who work in prisons, as a matter of fact, I, I don't want to talk about better prisons, uh, but sometimes I do end up doing that. Uh, uh, we forgive but, you. You know, I, but you know, I was I was impressed when I did some research in Cuban prisons that that. Cuban prisoners were members of the same unions and received the same pay scale and the same benefits as people did in the so-called free world. Yeah, so and that made a major difference. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, so again, I suppose the, 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 the question is, uh, uh, why do we continue to assume that the old structures, uh, the old structures of organizing the old epistemic structures are going to be the ones that uh, lead us to mm -hmm. um, a new world. Mm -hmm. um, well, it may, it may be that the precariat is overtaking the proletariat in some way or that we need to think them together, but the, the truth is that there are a lot of very interesting movements of people who are squatting or people who are, you know, um, you know in Barcelona, the, the amazing, um, uh, organization against banks that are, were for, foreclosing on people who had been living in homes or renting places for a very, very long time. And, um, and, and that did become uh, there a very important movement. And they, they put the head of that movement, Ede Kalau, in, into, into power, into political power. And it seems to me that you know, throughout Latin America and Europe and, and, and many other places, we're seeing new forms of organization that are trying to take um, into, into account new forms of economic destitution, mm. right? And, and building alliances on the basis of it. And the real question is, is that gonna happen in a way that also allo allows us you know, to think about the centrality of race, the centrality of class, the, the, or new ways in which class is being articulated under this economy, under this global economy? And what are the possibilities for transnational alliance? That's what I'm kind of trying to to suss out, like what, yeah. what, what, what's possible here? I'm gonna, I, I hate to interrupt you, but I'm gonna invite the audience in the few time, the few minutes we have remaining to continue this conversation. Um, if a mic will be passed around and why don't we start right here? Thank you. 
Hello, I just want to start by saying thank you for being here. Um, as real life like heroes and existing with us in the struggle, I know you have scars um, and yet you're still here and as a, which is what the charge for union time professor, emphasis on part time. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I'm in the struggle. I fight racism and sexism on a daily basis. However, in, in battling, it's better with groups. And yet, in these groups that I'm in, it hurts the worst when it's other people of color or other women who are like fighting each other, like we're crabs in a bucket. And so, when I'm at that moment and my, my, my soul hurts, I'm wondering, like, how do you heal when it's your own people? So do you want both of us to address yeah. that? No, I think that you do. I'm yeah. sure you have different techniques of healing, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a really challenging uh, problem. But I think that um, it also leads to the question of uh, how we build community um, and who constitutes our community, who helps to create our community. Um, um, and, you know, I, I raised the specter of identity politics before, and I, you know, I think that term is, has been so used and misused uh, because uh, uh, it is, um, black people, native people, Latinx people, um, women, the LGBTQ movement, uh, the disabled movement, these are the um, communities that have made the most progress when it comes to democracy in this country. And, and there's an effort to marginalize uh, uh, these communities by, simp re by referring to them, oh, they're just identity. Uh, they, these are special interests, uh, just identity politics. Uh, mm. uh, so I think that, that we have to acknowledge that. Uh, and then, of course, we have to find ways of um, surviving. I was uh, actually telling Judith the other day that uh, someone asked me in one of my lectures recently why I hadn't been assassinated. <laughs> <laughs> he said, and they named all the people who had been assassinated and said, well, why are you still here? Oh, God. Uh, and so I said, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. <laughs> but I do know that uh, as long as I am here, it's my responsibility to continue to do the work and to bear witness for those who haven't been able to make it this far. And that, of course, also involves um, doing what we often call self-care, uh, which I think should be collective self-care. Because oftentimes we, we assume that self-care is an individualistic uh, uh, process. That we, we have to go off and, 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 and heal ourselves before we can rejoin uh, the community of struggle. Um, and, and so I th some people are doing really interesting thinking about how we um, create collective modes of healing and self-healing and how we come to, um, how can we bring, allow people to bring their whole selves uh, into the space of struggle. Uh, because there is so much trauma. Mm. Uh, we, collectively, we represent, you know, as you were saying, so much pain and mm -hmm. so much trauma. And the assumption often is that, oh, we deal, we, we, you know, we find the therapist, we do whatever we need to do individually. But we've never figured out how to address that collectively. And I think that's one of the major challenges of uh, this period. That's one of the major challenges that young activists are going to have to uh, address. And I think um, you look like you're young. 
Uh, you, although, you know, the older you get, the, everybody, the, looks, the, everybody looks young, yeah. so. <laughs> Judith, do you want to? Uh, just, you know, I would just reiterate, um, there's a lot of pain and fear, and it's escalating. Uh, you know, we're seeing, you know, a lot of undocumented people living in massive fear, a lot of discretionary power being intensified on the part of police and immigration officials. We have a, a government that's clearly out of control. We don't know what's going to happen. And, and a lot of accelerating economic inequality, and people are feeling the deep fear of losing what they need in order to be okay financially, you know? And, and, and people who thought they were gonna be okay are no longer okay and are living with new forms of anxiety. And people who were never okay are being ground down by a kind of anxiety they've been living with their whole lives. So, and that gets, sometimes we get spiky then, right? We lash out, we're angry, we're, we're trying to find power somewhere, we, we're, 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 but it's because we're not building something together I mean, the minute we start coalescing and building something together, that's when you're part of something else. And it's, and it's a problem, because the so-called left, I presume we are the left, whoever the left is, we're, we're, we're not yet building. We're still disoriented, right? We're, but we're not yet building the way we need to be building. And I'm reminded of, of Angela's idea of res restorative justice, which is her alternative to, to the prison system. And that, that idea presumes that communities have the power to heal one another and to heal themselves, and that they are empowered with that. And there's a, there's a beauty to that notion that I think we need to think more about and, and come together to, to, to really th think, think about how that happens practically, person to person. I think we have someone um, even younger to speak to us. Uh, hi, my name is Aliyah Moore, and I'd like to say a question. Ask a question. Um, how can we, how can we close close prisons? Close prisons. Oh, wow. This is somebody who. Oh, has that's a great question. You know, that's a great question. Okay. Okay. Um, you really want the answer? Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I don't have the answer, but this is what, I'm a part of an ever larger group of people who really want to make sure uh, that prisons do not represent our future. So first of all, we have to make sure that no new prisons are built. And uh, people all over the country, are addressing uh, these issues there. Even, um, you know, sometimes there's the argument, but we really need a place for young people. So we need the youth detention facilities, the, ju the, the juvenile justice. No, no, no new prisons. And then there are efforts to shut down existing spaces. For example, Rikers Island is one of the, uh, we were talking about issues of, of ability and disability. Rikers Island constitutes one of the um, uh, uh, three largest mental institutions in the country, you know, along with Chicago and LA, Cooks County and LA County. And so, uh, if the pressure continues, Rikers Island will be shut down. It will no longer exist. But we have to, at the same time, uh, call for, you know the word incarceration? Have you ever heard that word? Mm -hmm. Well, incarceration basically means putting people in prison, right? Okay, so there's another word, and that's decarceration. That means, what does that mean? Taking, Taking people out. out of prison, absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, that is, and, and there are a number of other strategies I could talk about, but what's most important, and this is why prison abolition uh, represents a lot more than just getting rid of prisons. What's more important is to create, is to try to create a society that doesn't need prisons. So then what would, so, 
Tell me, what do you think we need? What do you think we need? What's the first thing that comes to your, to your mind? Schools, absolutely. <laughs> Schools, not prisons. You see? You know, and then we can talk about housing and health care and all of these things. That is precisely what it means to try to get rid of prisons. Thank you so much for the question and the answer. <laughs> But there's, there's a root problem. It's children are being taught these, oh. There's a root problem. Children are being taught these biases from the start and that's what causes discrimination. How are we supposed to stop this if we can't get to the parents and stop homophobia and transphobia and things like this? It's not their fault, it's they're being taught this way. Well, I'll, I'll say a few words and then I, I, I know that uh, uh, Judith, uh, uh, has something to say on, on this issue as well, uh, especially. Um, you know, we often become so um, frustrated by the immensity of the problems that we're facing. And, you know, racism is one of those huge, huge problems. How can we possibly, how can we possibly um, believe that, that one day racism will have been purged from our worlds? Uh, uh, homophobia, you know, how can we possibly believe that, that one day there will be um, a period in our history, we may no longer be around, and I think that's the, that's the key. Uh, we assume that in order for there to be any legitimate approaches to these great issues, that they're gonna have to pr provide some solutions like right now, you know. You understand what I'm saying? We want, and, and in a sense, capitalism has encouraged us to, th to think in temporalities that require us to want the answer right now. If you don't have the answer now, and especially if you don't have the answer in my lifetime, what does it matter? Because my, my life is the, is, the, is the measure of everything. So how, and I, I'm, I know there are many other ways to approach your question, but I'm, I'm thinking about um, you know, how we encourage a very different um, temporality when it comes to uh, the justice work, the work for equality that we're doing. You know, how, how do we learn how to do this work and, passionately and urgently, and yes, try to get a hold of the parents and try to, but the parents, a lot of the parents are not gonna change, you know, so, so, how, so how do we think about, well, what happens the next generation and then the generation after that? And I like um, uh, the fact that most indigenous people think in temporalities that, that are so much vaster and so much more capacious than the capitalist temporalities we work with. Uh, we think that, uh, you know, what is the five-year outcome? Like if you're, writing a, if you're writing a grant for some community organization, the foundation is gonna ask you, you know, what is the two-year outcome? What is the five-year outcome? Suppose we ask, well, what is the, what is the 100 year outcome? <laughs> you know, what is the 200 year outcome? Uh, and, and I think that's how we have to begin to think because um, we would not be gathered in this space today if it weren't for the work that people did uh, hundreds of years ago. <laughs> And so, you know, I've been, I've been thinking about the fact that, that, that we are the manifestation of the imagination of those who came before us. 
and who didn't give up because it wasn't going to be possible to completely uh, abolish colonization or completely get rid of slavery. They still struggled. And we are here as, uh, as a testament to that persistence. And so we also have to imagine our responsibility to that, uh, that long sense of history. Uh, and the fact that the work that we do now, even if it seems as if it felt like it's not making a major difference, it will make a difference. Uh, and there will be people gathered somewhere 200 years from now who will be thankful to us for the work that we did during the short time we were together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to begin to think in those terms. So this is really oh, horrible. No, 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 no. Okay. Oh, um, just, just briefly, um, when I was your age, I thought um, I basically um, didn't know any other queer people and um, the way it was talked about and the way my parents talked about it, it seemed like I was headed towards a psychiatric institution to get corrected. Um, but uh, luckily I found some other people who didn't think that way, right? So a little disobedience, a little bucking of the, what you've been taught, a little critical thought, a little community where you can think something new together. I was also taught that Israel was the, the saving place for the Jewish people and that it was a beacon of democracy in the Middle East and they didn't tell me that this, the founding of Israel involved um, the massive death of so many Palestinians and the expulsion of more than 800,000 and that, and that people still were living in the West Bank and Gaza with, 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 with no substantial political rights and that that there are over six million Palestinian refugees with no way to exercise their legitimate right of return. I mean, I, I was given, a, I, I was taught a lot, but you can unteach yourself and you can be taught differently and you can think and you can become part of communities that help you think well and that support you and allow you to be brave and courageous in moving beyond what you have been taught. Thank you. This, this time has ended, okay. but there will be a longer future well, I think, time. I, I think we, we probably should end on, um, okay. with everyone making a commitment to address the issues we talked about at the very beginning. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, this, th this is City Hall, right? And this is Council Chambers, right? So this is the center of Oakland. Well, the center of one part of Oakland. No. <laughs> and so what are we going to do to guarantee that this space is accessible? So let's think about that. You know, take it back to your organizations, to your communities. Uh, um, and thank you so much for coming here. <laughs>